to the wounded. Why is he not at his command post? The phone calls went to the Pentagon. It went through the military. And the military was sitting there saying, oh, hey, don't answer, you know, don't answer that phone, whatever it might be. Now, how would you like your fire department to sit there and say, well, I'm sorry, we can't come and put your house out and save your lives because the mayor didn't say so. And on 9-12, they changed the protocols again back to the first protocol, which was the fast scrambles, and that's what it is today. So the way that Rumsfeld's Pentagon managed this whole thing is they, they switched gears, okay? They switched out of having too fast and slow into slow, okay? And then they said, oh, we're bad, 9-12, let's go fast again. When the United States was attacked without warning at Pearl Harbor, after eight inquiries, General Walter Short, commander of the Army for the Defense of Hawaii, and Admiral Husband Kimmel, commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, were both charged with negligence and summarily dismissed. But after the 9-11 catastrophe, nobody, neither the Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, nor the Head of Civil Aviation, nor that of Air Defense, was either punished or removed from office. On September 10th, Brigadier General W. Montague Winfield asked Junior Officer Captain Charles Leidig to temporarily replace him as Director of Operations at the Pentagon Command Center from 8.30 a.m. on September 11th. Later that day, after Flight 93 was reported crashed, Winfield resumed control. Captain Leidig had only just completed a course qualifying him to run the command center. On September the 11th, Brigadier General David F. Worley Jr. was commander of the Andrews Air Force Base, the nearest one to the Pentagon. On September the 11th, Richard B. Myers, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in the absence of Chairman Shelton, was the temporary head of all U.S. Armed Forces. On the 14th of September, after only three days of investigations, the FBI announces it knows everything about the hijackers of the flights. We have, in the last 24 hours, taken the manifests and used those as an, evident, as an evidentiary base and have talked to many of the families of the victims and have successfully, I believe, identified many of the hijackers on each of the four flights that went down. Let's look at the Lockerbie case. It took two years to bring indictments in that case. Two years. In this case, in only three days, the FBI provided the names of all the hijackers without providing any evidence that they were actually on the flights. On the 12th of September, the Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Ashcroft, declares to the whole world that the passport of one of the hijackers had been found a few blocks away from the ruins of Ground Zero. Even though they had said that everything inside the towers had been burnt up or had been reduced to a fine dust. So, the steel was molten? But paper survived? Who were these hijackers? The official story states that 15 out of the 19 came from Saudi Arabia. That they were trained in Afghanistan and that they were Islamic fundamentalists, fanatical Muslims. Al-Qaeda is supposed to be a Salafist network. 
you know. And Salafism is a very, very Puritan strain of Islam that suggests that we need to follow very closely to the letter the activities of the Prophet Muhammad. So, were these people Islamic fundamentally? The evidence would suggest no. Muhammad Asa was basically not an Islamic fundamentalist. There was always drinking, always drinking. There wasn't wine, it was beer, or liquor, or whatever. There was always drinking, always. And they had massive supplies of cocaine. Muhammad and all these people that he was with, they were drunk and stoned out of their freaking minds. The identikits of the hijackers supplied by the FBI are truly bizarre. Each identikit corresponds to a number of persons. These persons are very different. They have different attitudes and different biographies. They live in different places, sometimes at the same moment. When you speak of Mohammed Atta, what Mohammed Atta? Is it the Mohammed Atta who was in Hamburg, Germany, being run by German intelligence? Is it that Mohammed Atta? Is it the Mohammed Atta who appears in Venice, Florida, which is a major locus for the National Security Agency? Who's supposedly training at a little flight school for a little single and dual engine Cessna aircraft and who's rooming with a man named Charlie Voss who was a CIA pilot who ran guns into Nicaragua and cocaine out for the Central Intelligence Agency. Is it that Mohammed Atta? Is it the Mohammed Atta? who spoke to his father on the 12th of September, as Newsweek reported, in an interview with his father in Cairo. Is it that Mohammed Atta? Is it the Mohammed Atta who appears in a bar called Shuckham's Bar in Hollywood, Florida, doing lines of cocaine and drunk on Stolichnaya vodka, and who, when asked to pay his bill, says, I work for United States Airlines. You think I can't pay my bill? And then he says, fuck God. This is not the behavior of an Islamic fanatic who is about to commit a suicide martyrdom operation. Prima che l'atta che risiede ad Hamburgo in Germania According to the official version, before Atta, who lived in Hamburg, Germany, moved to the United States, his American namesake was visiting an office of the Department of Agriculture where he spoke to an employee to request a loan of $650,000. With this loan, he wanted to rent a small aeroplane and attach a large tank of chemicals to it. Upon the refusal of the woman to give him the loan, he began to threaten her, saying he would cut her throat. Then he told her he was an American Airlines pilot. He threw a bundle of banknotes onto the desk and asked for information about the security systems of the Twin Towers. He even tried to buy a poster of the Pentagon that was on the wall of the office and then he finally went away. Well now, is this the typical behavior of a member of a secret sleeper cell? Isn't it more like the behavior of someone who is trying to be remembered? This is not the behavior of an Islamic fanatic who is about to commit a suicide mark. Secondo la versione ufficiale, the official version states that Alomari and Atta leave Florida heading for Boston. This is according to plan, since that is where the two aeroplanes due to be hijacked will depart. But they don't stop when they get to Boston, they continue to Maine. It is the afternoon of September the 10th. The next day will be the most important day in the two men's lives, a day on which they cannot make any mistakes. But what do they do? They go on a trip to Portland. They spend the night there and they attract attention to themselves with their noisy revelry. 
They also pay with credit cards in their names. They do everything they can to leave traces of their presence there. Next morning at 6 a.m., they fly from Maine to Boston. The plane that they are going to hijack takes off only half an hour after their flight lands. This is a very tight time window, potentially putting the whole plan in jeopardy. The circumstances surrounding the departure from Portland to Boston is very important, both in terms of the investigation and in shaping public opinion. It is there that the airport's CCTV cameras record the video in which we see the faces of Atta and Alomari. This video has been shown hundreds of times on television as evidence of the two terrorists boarding the aeroplane they are about to hijack. It's not true. That video shows them embarking at Portland. There is no evidence of the presence of these hijackers. It is simply something that the FBI tells us, without any proof. There is no proof. There is no way to prove the presence of any one of these patsies, these scapegoats on the planes. None at all. On September the 16th, one of the alleged hijackers of Flight 11, Abdel Aziz al Amari, went to the Jeddah consulate to protest his innocence to U.S. officers. al Omari, a pilot from Saudi Airlines, receives an official apology from the American officers in Riyadh. Then, on the 22nd of September, Walid al Shahiri announces he is still alive. He too is supposed to have hijacked Flight 11. From his house in Casablanca, Morocco, the impertinent al Shahiri declares his innocence. The following day, the 23rd of September, the Daily Telegraph publishes the protestations of innocence of Saeed al Gamdi and Ahmed al Nami, both of them still alive and well and pilots for Saudi Arabian Airlines. On the 27th of September, CBS tracks down Salem Al-Hazbi. According to the FBI, he was dead after Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon. But curiously, he persists in hanging around alive in Saudi Arabia, where he works in an oil refinery. Have the names of Al Omari, Al Shahiri, Al Gamdi, Al Nami, and Al Hazbi been deleted from the list of the hijackers with many apologies? No. No. Six years later, these 19 people are accused as being the sole perpetrators of the terror attack.